of Nuclear Energy, a four-part series exploring the evolving role of nuclear power in today's energy landscape. In this episode, we're looking ahead from small modular reactors to micro reactors and even nuclear fusion. A wave of innovation is reshaping how we think about nuclear energy. But what's real? What's hype? And how soon could these techniques help address our growing energy needs? To help us break it all down, I'm joined by Ed Blanford, co-founder and chief technology officer at Kairos Power, a company leading efforts to commercialize advanced fluoride salt-cooled high-temperature reactors. With a mission to dramatically reduce the cost of clean energy, Kairos Power is one of the most closely watched next-gen nuclear startups in the world. Ed, thank you for joining us for episode three in this series. Thank you for having me. So let's set the stage in terms of what's changing in nuclear. When most people think about nuclear energy, they picture these massive reactors built decades ago. What's different about the next generation of nuclear technologies that we're seeing today? Sure. So uh, what we're seeing today is really uh, an emphasis on changing the scale of the deployment. And so you, you, you mentioned the term small modular reactor. Let's take each of them one by one. So the overall scale of the plants being proposed and built today are generally smaller. So the plants that we operate today, we would generally think of them as gigawatt scale. So that's a thousand megawatts um, able to produce a large amount of electricity. Um, just a really transformative capability to get that much electrons on the grid, but the scale of those plants are quite large and the cost of those plants are also quite large. So a lot of the plants that are being built and proposed today are, are a smaller scale. So the technology that Kairos is developing, for example, our commercial scale is 75 megawatts, uh, which creates opportunities to build these plants in a different way. Sure. And then they can be useful to parts of the globe that would benefit from that size, right? So they're a little bit more flexible. That's correct. So there's a number of things that the size of the plant can afford you. Uh, first and foremost, the, the capital costs of plants that are smaller are going to be a lot, obviously, lower than the, the big gigawatt scale plants. So for utilities that are interested in investing in new nuclear, uh, you're moving away from this bet the house or bet the farm kind of endeavor where you're building very expensive capital plants. So building smaller plants does allow opportunities for smaller scale utilities to look into deploying nuclear in a different way. Yeah, that's exciting. And you've been at the forefront of this transformation with Kairos Power. So talk us through Kairos's approach, especially with your use of this molten, molten salt coolant. What sets that apart from traditional designs? Sure. So uh, good question. Um, one of the unique things about our technology is we use a high temperature coolant that operates at low pressure. We also have selected a fuel that is, uh, it performs very well at high temperatures as, as well. And the reason we've done that, it allows us to operate the plant in a unique way that's different from the plants that operate today. By being able to operate with basically low pressure during normal operations, that allows us to design the plant and the building that the plant sits within to be actually more economical uh, by using different fuel. And so we have a new fuel, a new coolant, but that really allows us to build the actual uh, buildings in a way that are much more economical. So today's power plants, the light water reactors that operate today, they're designed such that when we have things that go wrong, pressure builds up in the system and they have to have a containment structure that can withstand those types of accidents like we saw at Fukushima. By designing plants that are more evolutionary, that have different safety cases, we're actually able to build reactor buildings that are more economical in much more expedited fashion. So that's, that's really one of the advantages to the technology that Kairos is developing. So safer and cost saving is what I hear. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Okay, and we talked a little bit about the small modular, modular reactors and their flexibility. Talk to us a little bit more about why these SMRs and advanced reactors are generating excitement. So for those who are less familiar, what are those core differences compared to the conventional nuclear designs and what makes the, these newer designs so promising? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier, there's small and then there's also modular. M modular is another big part of the design. And so if you've heard about very small reactors like micro reactors, generally what people are envisioning is that those plants are built in a factory and then they're sent out on site. Um, for larger scale plants, generally, you know, above the, the 10, 50 megawatt range, 
Um, you have to go to site work. You can't just build plants and then send them out and, and to be deployed. So a lot of the modular work that Kairos is developing on is really trying to improve the efficiency of the site work when we're actually building and constructing the plant. And so when you look at the history of the big gigawatt scale plants, there's a lot of labor, a lot of contractors at the site, and a lot of the work is laid out in a very sequential way. And if you have delays early in that program, everything triggers delays downstream. And so the ability to uh, heighten efficiency at the site by, by doing more modular builds, it really enables you to drive down costs and the overall amount of time in construction, which is really important in this industry. and it, it's just that much more efficient. So it really does feel like the future. So that's exciting. It's being applied to nuclear in this way. So Kairos' power design, powers designs isn't just about being smaller. It's about using different materials and engineering to improve safety and economics. So can you explain what's unique about your reactor design and how it contributes to affordability and safety? Sure. So I, I mentioned earlier about our safety case. So the ability to use a coolant that operates at low pressure and high temperature really gives us better um, uh, safety at higher affordability. It allows us to get to higher efficiencies as well on, on power conversion, which is really important in improving the overall economics of the plant. Um, some of the unique technologies that we're leveraging actually to build the plant involve, for example, precast construction. So we mentioned earlier the importance of kind of parallelizing the build and leveraging what we call offsite or modular construction uh, to gain efficiencies. Cairo sees a lot of opportunities in building our reactor buildings through more novel and advanced construction methods. So that's an area where we see there's a lot of opportunity to drive down the overall cost of these structures. Okay, and so where will we see these structures? What are the ideal situations, cases, or locations that would use this kind of reactor technology? Where do you see it being deployed first? And it's global, I imagine, from your view, yes? It is global, but I'll just say right now, Kairos is building right now. So we are building this technology today. Uh, we are building the foundations for what we call our Hermes 1 demonstration reactor, and that's being built right now at the East Tennessee Technology Park in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So right now, Kairos is under construction uh, for our first reactor, which is the Hermes 1 building. So we're doing that right now. Um, and that's a great place for us to be building. Uh, it's a community that knows a lot about nuclear technology with the Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, as well as all of the, the nuclear uh, industry that's local there. So it's a terrific place for us to build. Um, you asked about where would we deploy. Um, right now, we have a commercial partnership with Google. So we're working with Google as a partner to locate where we're going to deploy under our initial agreement. But beyond that, we see a lot of opportunities to, to deploy both domestically as well as internationally. Um, right now, we are focused on the domestic market. So we are focused on United States deployment. And we see a lot of opportunity to deploy um, domestically, but longer term, um, this capability, this technology um, is highly attractive to deploy internationally. Okay, well, uh, we, we imagine that with the right regulatory support, this can all be scaled quickly and reach that commercial global viability, right, potentially. But let's, let's actually delve into that a little bit more. There have been some policy and public perception and deployment challenges, not just for SMRs and innovation, but, you know, nuclear sector more broadly. So let's get more specific with advanced nuclear since that's where you sit. There, it, it's a very different landscape than traditional nuclear, right, today. So what is it about today's leg regulatory system that needs to change so that it can actually keep up with the technology so that we can see some of these potential benefits really reach their full promise? Uh, so I would argue we actually don't need to see a lot of regulatory change. So Kairos has spent a fair amount of time engaging very closely with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We've done a lot of work in what we call pre-application space, which means we've submitted a number of topical reports to really de-risk our licensing case. Um, we hold three construction permits for Hermes 1 and for Hermes 2. Um, we feel very good about the existing regulatory regime that is out there today. So there's been a push to look at how DOE could potentially license reactors. Um, for us, uh, we view that as a bit of a step backwards. We're already licensing through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We have a site. 
We have construction permits we're building today. Uh, we do not believe that the existing regulatory regime through the NRC is actually a stopgap. Uh, quite frankly, we view it as very, um, it's really the right regulatory framework to be pushing advanced reactors. And, you know, from our vantage point, there really isn't a more sophisticated regulatory agency out there in the world that can really look at advanced nuclear technology, both incorporating these advanced passive safety systems that are, that are utilized in obviously these plants, but there's really no better regulatory agency out there. So we view that as really the right path forward. There are changes in the existing regulatory framework that could be helpful as we look at advancing nuclear power plants, but it's not a uh, burn it down and then build it back kind of approach. It's more evolutionary. And so we believe our, our path through regulations to date with both Hermes 1 and 2 is the right pathway for moving the technology forward, and we'll continue to do that through uh, NRC licensing. Okay. Well, that's very promising, and that's uh, attractive for the next generation that's interested in potentially entering this sector to know that the regulatory burden is is not necessarily, there's a perception of that, but it may not necessarily be the reality. So that's a very promising outlook for the regulatory landscape. Thank you for sharing that. There is the issue of public perception though, and there's this persistent critique that nuclear power is just too slow and too expensive. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, I think historically the, you know, there's been a lot of challenges with nuclear. And if you look historically at nuclear, it's it, it's not always, I think right now we have bipartisan support, which is really, really, really important. It used to be uh, people were very interested in promoting nuclear um, on, on the conservative side, but we're generally maybe more against climate change and issues to that effect. And then if you look on, on the left, you saw a lot of folks that were maybe predisposed to not like nuclear, but were more predisposed to concerning about climate changes and effects um, on, on, the, on the power grid and beyond. And so I think we now have a much more bipartisan view on nuclear, and I think it's better that it's now shifted towards can we move the technology faster rather than is it safe or safe enough, um, which I think is a really important transition in the conversation. So right now we've got a bipartisan support for nuclear, and I think it is fair to say what is keeping nuclear behind? Why can't we move faster? Um, I think there's a lot of effort right now through the executive orders to pr promote nuclear, um, which has been very positive. But ultimately, it's down to the industry to actually deliver. And I would argue this is our moment um, as a nuclear industry. There's been a number of these. If you look at sort of the history of nuclear renaissances and will, will it come and why is it not coming? But this is really our opportunity to build. And so we have to be able to deploy. We have to be able to honor the commitments that we're making. If we say we can deploy in a cost-effective way, it's our time to really show that and to go do that. And so we have to look for novel ways of doing the deployment. We have to con control construction costs. Um, we can't let projects spiral. So from my vantage point, it's really on the industry right now to show it can actually deliver. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you are, you're a strong advocate for the industry and you're making it very clear that it is it's the industry's moment. Now is the time to really take advantage of the the, the landscape that the sector finds itself, itself in and to really seize the opportunity and shine. So I think that's very clear. While I have you, I just want to clarify two more things for our audience. So those who are not in the nuclear space that may be, get confused between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So what's your take on how far off is fusion from being a serious player in this energy mix? Okay, um, well, I'll try and take that one at a time. So fission, we're generally taking uh, fissile material um, atoms and we're splitting them from a, a big atom to, to two smaller pieces and releasing energy. Fusion, we're taking very small atoms, we're combining them together to release energy. Two, two different forms of, or, or means of producing energy, um, fission and fusion. Um, all the plants that operate today um, uh, run off of a fission process. That's where the nuclear fuel cycle operates right now. And of course, Kairos is developing a fission technology. Um, there's a lot of interest in fusion. Um, there's been a lot of developments in fusion. Um, like everybody, you know, will we'll kind of continually point out, um, there are engineering challenges that will prevent fusion from truly getting electrons on the grid 
in the very near term. Now, some of my colleagues on the fusion side would argue that that time is sooner than I may be implying, uh, but there are substantial challenges around the materials that have to perform in these environments. Um, to actually have a system that's producing electrons reliably, you have to have a consistent um, source of energy. And so you've got to have a mature industrial plant. And so I would argue there are still some engineering developments that need to happen until we actually see fusion take off. But there's no doubt that it's a very uh, impactful uh, source of energy longer term. Um, and there's a lot of promise, but I would argue it's still quite a ways away until we're actually going to be relying on fusion energy for electrons on the grid. But would you say that that becoming part of the energy mix is inevitable? On Yes, on very long time scales, I would argue. So um, again, I would say that is the challenge, right? Right now, we need solutions today. So this administration is looking for solutions over the next two years. Um, certainly not on the timescales that I believe we will see Q, uh, fusion be economically viable. So I would argue over my lifespan, yes, we will see fusion come onto the grid, but it will take some time until we get there. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Thanks for clarifying that. Last question. Thank you for giving us so much time and insight and expertise. I know our audience is really valuing this discussion, and you're probably going to get some messages asking for follow-ups or maybe asking for employment. But Either way, it's not a bad outcome. What is one big misconception about next generation nuclear that you wish more people understood? And the next generation of workers to know as well. Um, well, two things. So first off, we are building right now. And so I wanna make sure that's very clear. Um, I made that point right now. Kairos is building our, our nuclear technology right now. And so I think that's really, really important for people to recognize that it's actually happening. It's not a conceptualization. Um, it's actually happening right physically right now. What I would argue to people that may be interested in nuclear is nuclear itself, it, it sounds like a funny field, a funny, you know, a funny industry, but the reality is it's very cross-functional. It involves every discipline um, that you could even think of, whether it's behavioral science, whether it's human reliability considerations, civil engineers that design the big concrete structures for buildings, or even you know, repositories that house nuclear waste. Um, we need people in this industry that come from all backgrounds. Um, it's not an exclusive area where you need to be trained to a certain um, unique discipline. And so I would argue, um, get involved, get engaged, read more about it. My, you know, you probably will find out that your background, your interest, there's actually areas uh, within the nuclear industry where your skill sets are actually probably in need today. So um, I think that is a big misperception is nuclear is much more cross-functional and it involves very different dialogues with you know, society, with communities than you might have in other industries as well. So get, get involved. Love that. Love that we're leaving on that note. So thank you so much at Blanford for taking the time and joining us for episode C three of the Future of Nuclear Energy series. Thank you, Ed, for your time. Thank you for having me.